to the Heritage Room. We're very happy to have you here this evening. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background about the Heritage Room. Some of you are probably familiar with it, but others of you may not be. The Heritage Room is a special service provided at the public library, but it is not tax supported. Uh, we are in a uh, fund drive to raise $300,000 to match a federal grant of $100,000. And with that money, we'll have an endowment. Then we'll be able to maintain the room without uh, having to go to the city fathers for taxes. And uh, we hope that you will uh, attend our holiday house festivities at the old J.C. Penney building on Saturday, December 6th. And we also, I think Jane Geske back there may have some raffle tickets if any of you are interested. This evening we have a very special person, Ted Guzer is with us. He's going to read some of his poetry. Ted served on the Lincoln City Library Board for a few years, so I had the pleasure of working with Ted. Ted, as you know, is uh, from Iowa, and he lives in Lincoln. No, no, he no longer lives in Lincoln. He lives near Seward, excuse me. He is the second vice president for Business for Lincoln Benefit Life, and he's best really known for his poetry. He has published extensively in magazines and quarterlies, including The New Yorker, Poetry, The Nation, The American Poetry Review, Prairie Schooner. And this evening, he has some hot off the press publications for us that he will be telling you about a little later. Please join me in welcoming Ted Kuser. Hi. I um. I didn't know in coming over here exactly what I was what I was going to do tonight, and uh, I thought about it on the way. I've got several of my books along, but I think I'm going to start with some pieces from this book, which has just come out. It's called The Blizzard Voices. Some of you may have seen this when it was performed at the Community Playhouse as a play. Um, basically, this piece is a series of reminiscences of people who lived through the blizzard of 88. And I went back and I used the county histories. I used books in the Heritage Room. Um, uh, I used the, the reminiscences of the Blizzard Club, who were people who survived the Blizzard of 88. And I formed these up into, um, into poems. And I, uh, w what interested me about them to start with was the sort of compression of these reminiscences and, and the way that they always form around. You know, in sculpture, you have an armature, which the sculpture is formed around. And in each of these reminiscences, there was one single sort of concrete detail about which the reminiscence sort of spun. And uh, you'll hear some of these things come up, and they're usually the odd detail in these things. And, and uh, so I would take one of these things and kind of build a poem around them. I'll just read through these. Now, this, these were for mixed voices, men and women. Um, the, the, the single poems don't have any titles other than that there's a direction that a man speaks this or a woman speaks this. <coughs> this first piece is spoken by a woman. 1888. A Thursday, the 12th of January. It had been warm all morning with a soft southerly breeze melting the snowdrifts back from the roads. There were bobwhite and prairie chickens out pecking for grit in the wheel ruts. On lines near shacks and soddies, women were airing their bedding. Bright quilts that, quilts that flapped and billowed, ticks sodden as thunderheads. In the muddy schoolyards, children were rolling the wet gray snow into men, into fortresses, laughing and splashing about in their shirt sleeves. Their teachers stood in the doorway and watched. Odd weather for January, a low line of clouds in the north, too warm, too easy, and the air filled with electricity. An iron poker held up close to a stovepipe would spark and a comb drawn through the hair would crackle. One woman said she'd had to use a stick of wood to open her oven door. Then a man speaks. Now in that one I just mentioned, the, that one is made up of several little details, but the, things about, the thing about the prairie chickens pecking for grit and the wheel ruts and so on are those little details that I went for. Um, it's interested me, when I used to uh, occasionally teach a class at the university for Fred Link, um, I would, one of my exercises I would do with my students was to ask them to imagine doing a drawing of an abandoned farmhouse. 
And what you do in this exercise is you go around the room and each person supplies some, something that they would expect to see in this scene. And people would say, windows broken out, long grass, a uh, roll of fence wire, shingles falling off the roof, uh, paint peeling, all of those things that any one of us in this room could make up in, an, in our imagination. But when you get this thing assembled, this drawing, this imaginary drawing, you have nothing in it but the expected details, and it is never quite real. So what you want to do in a poem is to drop in, or in a piece of fiction, is to drop in something that is incongruous or which is very specific because that all of a sudden makes the whole thing flare into life. Like, for instance, in, a, in this farm scene, I used to use the example of uh, <clears throat> after you've got all these details out in front of us, all the ones that we could make up, then you throw in a potato chip bag lying in the driveway or one of those uh, colored uh, big wheel tricycles that kids use, those plastic things. Anything that doesn't quite fit, because the minute you drop that detail into the scene, all of a sudden everything comes to life. And so I was trying to, sort of looking for those details when I assembled these pieces. Okay, this is a man speaking now. Father and I had pulled the pump up out of the well to put new leathers in the cylinders. I looked toward the house and saw that our cats were spinning around and around on the steps as if they were drunk. Then the air was suddenly full of snow, weeds, dust, and fodder blowing out of the northwest. We ran in and pulled the door shut, snapping the bottom hinge in the wind. A wall of snow hit the house and shook it hard, and it grew dark as night. We had plenty of coal to burn, for Father had bought a load the week before. Through the night, the house rocked like a cradle, cracking much of the plaster loose. In the morning, we found the wind had packed the snow so hard our horses could walk on it without breaking the crust. The drifts were there till June. One man who was lost that day had been shelling corn and had gone to a neighbor's to borrow a grain scoop. Halfway home he was caught by the storm and he left the scoop in the snow near the road. He wandered ahead of the wind and was found that spring when it thawed 12 miles southeast of his home. My Henry was cutting ice on the plat with a good-sized crew of men from Kozad. Mules pulled the marker and plows, and the men did the sawing. Others floated the blocks to the bank and loaded them onto the wagons. The banks were so high, the crew didn't see the blizzard coming until it was right on top of them. They could hardly force the mules, four span of them, to face into the storm. The wind was so bad, the men took turns at the driving while others laid in the wagon boxes. None of them died, but some lost fingers and toes that day. My maiden name was Hannah, and I was 12 at the time. We had been playing fox and geese in the schoolyard during the afternoon recess when the blizzard bore down out of the northwest, roaring and whistling loud as a train. There was lightning in front, and it looked like bales of cotton 25 feet high, tied up with flashing silver wire. I shall never forget that night as we stood close by the stove in that creaking, drafty schoolhouse, doing our best to comfort the little ones who were cold and afraid of the darkness. We sang all the songs we knew, including Blow Winter Winds As Hard As You Will, We Shall Be Gay and Happy Still. There's another one of those details, this cloud with his lightning playing out in front of it looking like silver wire on this bale of cotton you know it's, uh, um, people sometimes people in working with the reminiscence like this struggle so hard to come up with figurative language and they come up with this sort of uh, a slant figurative language like this huge bale with this flashing silver wire that I think is really beautiful um, I had been to the schoolhouse to see if the children were safe we decided they should stay where they were, for they had coal enough for the night and food, biscuits a neighbor had baked and spread with molasses and a pail of hot coffee. I started out riding for home, but finally had to lead the horse who was blinded. Once he opened his mouth and the wind choked him so that he fell. I got him over against a straw stack and left him there for the night and made it to home on foot by following a fence line. These reminiscences of the, of the blizzard, and there were, there were you know, obviously thousands of them uh, that were recorded in these histories. And very often, people found their way home by hanging onto a fence, or there's an instance in here in which 
they got down on their hands and knees and followed the clods under the snow where a fire guard had been plowed. Um, or following, a, there's a woman in here who follows a row of sunflower stalks feeling her way through this storm. People were lucky if they had a blind horse because a blind horse would go home, would turn in the right direction and, and, and find its way home, whereas a horse that could see would be distracted by this blizzard and would be lost. I would occasionally, in the, in the dramatic version of this, I had some pieces that don't appear in the book and they were skip rope rhymes and things. Um, the, the children skipped rope to keep warm a lot of times in, these, in many of these reminiscences because the firewood had gone, they'd burned up the firewood and so they skipped rope and sang these skip rope rhymes. But I still, once I got the skip rope rhymes out and some other things, I had sort of pared out all the humor out of this so I felt like I had to leave a little bit in and this one, I, this one is funny to me, it may not be to you. I didn't like our teacher and often got in trouble for little or nothing. She'd have me standing for hours. On the day of the blizzard, I was just standing there when the first blast shook the school and blew the stove out. Without dropping one stitch of that lesson, she turned to me and said, Nettie, you may sit down. I, I occasionally would throw in pieces that I fabricated about so that I could get the facts in about the storm, about how the weather changed. I've looked at weather maps, the Army weather maps of 1888 from the storm. And you know these bullseyes things you see on weather maps, the more dense the circles are, the more violent the storm is. And over Montana, there were two of these turning this way, and they just were sucking this draft of this tremendously frigid Arctic air down through them and across the plains. Depending where on the plains you were that day, there was between eight inches and a foot of snow fresh on the ground. From all accounts, the blizzard picked it up and ground it fine to a powder, then added another foot of new snow to it. The drifts on the morning after the storm were 20 and 30 feet deep. In one low draw, a windmill 35 feet high was covered clear up to the topmost blades. Houses and barns were buried and one man found his soddy by falling in through the roof. The temperature dropped from just above freezing at three to 50 below the next morning. I was an Ohio girl who taught in a country school. How I remember that day. When the blizzard hit, it blew some of the shutters closed with a bang, breaking some panes, and the snow came pouring in. Toward evening, our fuel was gone, so we set out walking, holding each other's hands. It was impossible to see, but we followed a row of dead sunflower stalks all the way to a nearby farm. I never see a sunflower now that I don't count my lucky stars. Father had plowed a fire guard alongside the house and barn the previous fall. You know what a fire guard is? You used to do this for yeah. You used to do this for prairie fires. You know, you'd get you you plow about a 20-foot strip around anything you didn't want to burn. And when the prairie fire came, it would just sweep out around. Father had plowed a fire guard alongside the house and barn the previous fall. When the fence played out, we followed the guard by crawling along and feeling the clods with our hands. I lost some fingers, but was lucky. They found my uncle Silas frozen, standing upright between two of his horses. This one, this next one, I, I think is a very touching piece. Corn was at 12 cents a bushel, a good deal cheaper than coal, so we fed our stoves with corn and sometimes with twists of hay or cow chips. Some folks had the new hay burner stoves that would burn all night on one twist, but not us. On the night that the big storm struck, we burned the floorboards from the side porch and some of the furniture because we couldn't reach the barn for fuel. My sister was born about two in the morning with my grandmother tending my mother. We pinned up quilts and sheets along the walls and over the bed to keep the snow off mother and the baby. This one, this next one ends with, a, with something that we've all heard a mother enumerating her children, but, but I, I left the language just as it was because I, I really like the way it sounds. That morning, the sun had been out and bright, and the new snow sparkled like diamonds. 
At noon, I noticed a cast of thin clouds to the west and a rainbow completely around the sun. We had a span of streetcar mules, which we bought in Omaha to break the side with. There's another one of those details, streetcar mules, the kind of thing you wouldn't expect at all. We had a span of streetcar mules, which we bought in Omaha to break the side with. My Lewis had taken them to get a load of buckwheat flour at the mill and bring it back to the store that we kept in those days. When the storm hit, I knew he'd never get back that night. So I tied a clothesline out to the cob house and back and brought in cobs to burn. All night the wind moaned and cried, but we were safe by the stove. My Otto, who was seven, my Lori, who was five, and my little Susan, just three. I'll skip a couple of them here. One of the Halverson boys thought he could make it over to a neighboring house to bring back food and blankets. He put on two of our coats and a scarf around his face. We had some rags that we used to wipe the blackboards off, which we tied around his wrists and ankles. Out he went, vanishing into the storm a few feet from the building. All of us children took turns standing out in the entry, beating on pails and pans to guide him over and back. He brought back all the blankets those people could spare in a tin of beef. He was so tired when he stumbled back to us that he couldn't speak for an hour. In all my years, I never saw another thing like that storm. When it came, it felt as if an enormous fist had struck the house. Snow, fine as flowers, sifted in under the eaves and piled along the walls. Our youngest, Jim, was at school on a place two miles above, and we were worried sick for fear he'd try to get home and be lost. You couldn't see your hand at the end of your arm out in it. Excuse me. My husband led one of the horses up the lane but had to turn back. The snow had frozen the horse's eyes. Halver was just drying out by the stove when we heard a knocking out on the porch. And there stood Jimmy's pony, covered with ice and snow with a bag on her halter, and in it a note which said, Your boy is safe at the school. When the wind and snowstorm struck, our teacher dismissed the school and told us to get for home. My older brother and I started out on our horse, but the snow was so blinding we soon were lost. We let the horse loose, taking the blanket with us, and walked with the wind, hoping to find some sort of shelter. We finally had to dig down into a drift, wrapping the blanket around us. Billy died in the night. I thought he was only asleep. At dawn, I dug out finding that we were in sight of the home place. They had to cut my feet off. Some of you may have, uh, in, in, the, in the state capitol building, seen the mural of Minnie Mae Freeman and the, from this blizzard, you know, Minnie Mae Freeman. It's an abstract mural, but Minnie Mae Freeman was a hero in, of the, heroine of the blizzard and led these school children to safety. And in the Grand Hall there, whatever you call that, just outside the rotunda, there's a, a mural on the wall of Minnie Mae Freeman. This is a little bit about Minnie Mae. As the news of the storm got out, it seemed that the papers needed a heroine, someone to fix in the public eye as an example of courage out on the savage prairies. They chose Minnie Mae Freeman, a girl in her teens who taught school in a soddy near Ord. When the wind came up that day, it blew in the door, then ripped off a good part of the roof. Many lined up the children and led them out into the storm, hand in hand, 16 of them. They reached a house a half mile off and were saved. Many got mail from all over the country to her great embarrassment. And then many answers. I was embarrassed, all right. Of all the children saved, and there were many, they chose my school to make a story of. Besides, the papers looking for romance wrote of a man supposed to be my fiancé that I scarcely knew. The B, our paper there in Ord, sold pictures of the school for a dollar apiece, and people from everywhere sent me letters and cards and told me their troubles. I'll skip ahead here again a little bit. Um, 
There are a number of them in which the, the, peop, the people who are reminiscing at, at that time when these, many of these things were recorded were in their 70s and 80s, uh, can't remember the names of, the, of their classmates or can't remember the names of their teachers. I don't remember the name of our teacher, but she was scarcely more than a girl. She knew enough to tell us we weren't to leave the school till someone came to get us. Some of the big boys bragged that they could make it for sure, but she wouldn't budge, just stood at the door with folded arms and a switch. Any one of those boys could have tossed her over a shoulder and carried, a, carried her a mile without breaking a sweat, but they respected her and did just what she told them to. Through the night, we kept that cannonball stove as red as a cherry by burning coal and corn cobs, while the little children slept covered with coats on benches. The teacher told us stories and read from the Bible until our parents came for us. I wonder what her name was. We were out of flour for bread and father went to a neighbor's to borrow some. But he got off the road coming back and wandered out over the prairie. After a spell, he fell over a stone and knew he was in the quarry to the south of our place. He made it home from there. When he came through the door, he was covered with ice with that flower pail still in his hand. Lots of these in these two. Early in the evening of February the 4th, this is some weeks, you know, a couple weeks after the storm. Early in the evening of February 4th, a fellow came to the door to tell us somebody would found the body of my cousin. A pitchfork handle and his cap were sticking out of the snow. It was no small job digging him out. The snow was packed around him hard. We did the job of digging by the light of a lantern and got the body home a little after sunrise. He was 20 years old. This is a, you know this type of person here. This is a woman speaking. I remember how in that wind the cow's tail stuck out sideways. We got them into the barn after a good deal of work and fed and watered them. My outfit, I think, was ideal for going out to the barn and back. A bandana tied over my mouth, a big sunbonnet with a sack doubled over my head and pinned at the throat, a coat with a slicker, a pair of overalls, felt boots under my overshoes, and heavy mittens for my hands. One of the older boys dared little Nels Olson to run over across the road just to see how cold it was. Can't you imagine this, you know? And he did. But coming back, he couldn't see into the wind and missed the school. He had only a little jacket on, no boots or hat at all. The teacher sent some of us out to see if we could find him, and we tied a scarf to the fence to, keep, to help us find our way back. But little Nels wandered past and found the scarf and put it on. We finally found him and made it back to the school, but he was badly frozen and lost his fingers and thumbs. The Indians were too smart to be caught by a blizzard, and only a few of them died. They stayed warm in their lodges and waited it out. One man named Rough Clouds died while hunting, though his friend and dog survived. According to one account, a band of Omaha came through the town of Silver Creek a week after the storm had passed carrying one of their brothers who had frozen to death. They were displaying his body for a nickel a look. They headed east toward Omaha, intending to take the train still farther and to show the corpse in cities along the way. That's bu the Buffalo Bill influence, I call that, you know. And these are the last two pieces. A woman speaks this one. Father turned over the wagon and crawled in under it for the night. When he got home, we cut off his buffalo boots, put his feet in cold water, and rubbed his face with handfuls of snow. He recovered unharmed. But years later, in a depot in Iowa, I saw one not so lucky. There was nothing left of him but his trunk and head. Both arms, both legs were gone. They had him strapped in a wheelchair there, waiting to get on the train. And then a man speaks the final piece. So go the old stories, like wind in the long grass, loose wind 
singing in fences, wind like the white wolf moving in over the snow. Nobody knows now how many died. Some say 200 or more in Dakota Territory, Nebraska, and Kansas. Few records were kept. The dead were buried at home in poorly marked graves in the corners of fields. All that was long ago. But the wind in the hedgerow, the wind lifting the dust in the empty schools, the wind which in the tin fan of the windmill catches, turning the wheel to the north, that wind remembers their names. If you're interested in this book, this has just come out. This was published by the Beeler Press, which is a fine press in St. Paul, Minnesota. The paperback edition, I brought some in. The, if, if, if you don't buy one, stop and take a look at the drawings. The drawings were done by Tom Port, who's an artist, lives in Indiana. And I think I'm, this is the first really good-looking book I've ever had done. I'm real proud of these drawings. Uh, if you're interested in the signed limited edition, I don't happen to have any, but they're selling them for a hundred and a quarter a piece in St. Paul. So I'll try to get you one. I'll show you a couple of new pieces that I've done just recently and uh, give you an idea of the kind of thing I'm working on right now. I, uh, I do, a, do a lot of my writing by getting up early in the morning and listening to sounds and trying to, it, if, you, if you write very early in the morning when, while your mind is trying to make just logical connections, often you can come up with metaphors that you wouldn't find later on in the day at all. And I got up the other morning and I, I got to thinking, I'd been up about 10 minutes, I got to thinking, well, wouldn't it be interesting if all these sounds I'm hearing outside in the darkness, it was before light, are really disattached from the thing that makes the sound, and as soon as the sun comes up, everything has to refasten itself to whatever it was that made the sound. So this is a little poem that addresses that. A November Dawn. First light at six, and sounds that have all night stood by themselves in the darkness, now must seek something to fasten to. The cry of the windmill finds the windmill waiting breathless by the barn. The wind in the fir tree finds the tree and settles softly into the branches. And the hoot of the owl floats up next to the owl on the chilly air. I work at uh, an insurance company about a block from here, and we get all kinds of ridiculous reports from data processing department particularly, things that I can't understand at all. And I found one the other day called Terminal Statistics. Now this, what this is, is this is a report of everyone who is using a, a, a computer terminal. It counts the number of times that they have pressed the keys in the month. And every day there's a tally. There'll be a name. Uh, Beth Smith, and then there'll be 500, 400, you know, 323, all the way across the month, and then there's a grand total for the month. And I assume that it has some, it's, it was designed probably by the people who put the software together to measure pr productivity, but it is a hideous thing, you know, the idea of measuring out your life this way. So I wrote a little poem today about this. It's called Terminal Statistics. We have counted the number of times each terminal operator has touched a key in the month of October, and you have won. You touched your keys at least 300 times a day, and sometimes more than a thousand. For the month, while all of the leaves were falling red and yellow over the river and flights of geese wheeled south, you touched those little plastic keys more than 17,000 times. More than anyone else in the company, you with those swift, long fingers and steady blue eyes. I doubt very much if you counted those keystrokes, but nevertheless, we were counting for you. We like that sort of production, Wendy Jensen, and this certificate is your award. I want to, when I set that in print, I'm going to have Wendy's name and I'm going to hand letter it with a, you know, with a, in Gothic lettering in there. Um, I was an architecture student when I was an undergraduate for a little while, about two or three years, and then I dropped out of architecture. But I've, I've been fascinated with houses all my life and buildings. And I love to build things. Uh, my wife and I live out in the country, and I, if given the lumber, I would never stop hammering things together. I just love it. And, and this, this is a poem that I began almost 10 years ago, and I keep going back to thinking that I want to go further with it. And I dug this up today when I was thinking about it. 
My mother was raised in uh, northeastern Iowa in the bluff country along the Mississippi River. And uh, there's a town there, Guttenberg, Iowa, which is a beautiful little town, a lot of stone buildings and these big sandstone bluffs up on there in the Mississippi coming down through there. And it's, uh, it's a place where um, uh, uh, Marquette and Joliet landed, uh, you know, when they made their explorations in 1763 and so on. There's a lot of history there. But in this town, there's a button factory. And when I was a little boy, I used to fish in the river next to this button factory. And it's a big limestone, kind of a Quonset-type building. And it, the back is open right onto the river so you could bring up the boats and so on with these clam shells. And in the button factory, they take the clams and peel them out of the shells and throw the clams back in the river. And then they punch these button blanks out of these shells. And there were all these shells laying around on the riverbank with all these holes drilled in them. And it, it somehow or other has fascinated me for years. We used to collect these, these shells, and I have one at home someplace. But um, I decided that what I would do is to try to write something about in, in which I actually built this building that I loved so much. And this is the first section of a, what I would like to have be a longer poem about Guttenberg and the history of this area. It's called For Buttons of Pearl. From the bluffs which overlook the Mississippi, great fists of yellow limestone pushing through forests of oak, they broke off 20-ton knuckles of rock, first boring with hand drills, a slow ticking of hammers, then driving in wedges of steel, sledgehammers ringing through mist down the echoing valley, then cheering as each huge mass cracked free, turned on its base, tipped, and began to roll, bounding and crashing through brush to the mud road below, swallows darting out over the river, an owl flapping away. The faint sound somewhere above of deer running, scattering pebbles, unseen in green shadow. Then with mallets and chisels they cut these stones into blocks the size a man could carry and stacked these up on stone boats of oak beams bolted together their hot mules waiting in harness in the blue shade of the bluffs, the rock dust on their dark backs like a powder of light, of yellow sunlight falling. It was like moving a bluff into town one piece at a time. It took nearly all summer to move the cut stone from the woods to the bank of the river. In the hills behind them, others were burning the scrap stone for lime for the mortar, stacking the rock in great kilns of logs covered with mud and feeding these fires with wood. Then there were timbers to get, long, rough-hewn, hardwood joists brought up on horse-drawn wagons from Millville, the new wood souring the air with its freshness, that steam-powered sawmill deep in the bottomland willows, thwucking and hissing and crying, the yellow planks stacked up like hay on the heavy four-horse wagons. From far downstream on a boat like a floating wedding cake came kegs of square-forged nails, millwork, sashing and glass, and a group of men and women who were going further upstream to Prairie du Chien, La Crosse, Winona, Minneapolis, the women under their parasols, the men in white celluloid collars. On the bank, the shy young Germans stood in their shirt sleeves and watched as the deckhands unloaded. It was November already, the days like cold spring water. Behind them, the great bluffs rose crackling with color, red sumac and oak, golden maple and ash. The horses, their nostrils smoking, cropped the long grass by the river. I'm having a wonderful time with this thing. If I can just get back to it a little bit. Um, I'll read you a few things from these other books of mine. Both of my, my last books were... Um, published by University of Pittsburgh Press. They published my selected poems in 1980 and uh, a new book of mine in 85. I'll give you a few from this. I've been fascinated for years with secondhand stores. I spent a lot of my time in secondhand stores and I'd like to tell you right now that this very blue Hickey Freeman suit that I have on here this evening, which is probably when I if you were to buy this at Ben Simons, it would cost you $650, in which I wore this all day long at the insurance company. I got for $25 at the Junior League thrift shop right down the street. Down here. So that's a recommendation for the Junior League thrift shop. <clears throat> the, uh, 
This one's called In the Basement of the Goodwill Store. In musty light, in the thin brown air of damp carpet, doll heads and rust, beneath long rows of sharp footfalls like nails in the lid, an old man stands trying on glasses, lifting each pair from the box like a glittering fish and holding it up to the light of a dirty bulb. Near him, a heap of enamel pans as white as skulls looms in the catacomb shadows, and old toilets with dry red throats cough up bouquets of curtain rods. You've seen him somewhere before. He's wearing the green leisure suit you threw out with the garbage, and the Christmas tie you hated, and the ventilated wingtip shoes you found in your father's closet and wore as a joke, and the glasses which finally fit him, through which he looks to see you looking back, two mirrors which flash and glance, are those through which one day you too will look down over the years, when you have grown old and thin and no longer particular, and the things you once thought you were rid of forever have taken you back in their arms. This is a poem about my son when he was very small, and I, uh, my first wife and I were divorced when my son was about two and a half years old, and I spent a lot of time driving back and forth to Iowa to see him. This little poem is called The Constellation Orion. I'm delighted to see you, old friend, lying there in your hammock over the next town. You were the first person my son was to meet in the heavens. He's sleeping now his head like a small sun in my lap. Our car whizzes along in the night. If he were awake, he'd say, Look, Daddy, there's old Ryan. But I won't wake him. He's mine for the weekend, old Ryan, not yours. Up there in Guttenberg, Iowa, where this button factory is, my, uh, my grandparents, my grandfather farmed until he was 65 years old. The farmhouse burned. He sold the farm to his sister-in-law, moved into town, and built a standard gas station. This was, he was born in 1874, so figure whatever it would, would be when he was 65. And he kept this standard gas station until he was 92, and he sold it to a cousin. And then he took up cracking walnuts for a living. And he set up a stump in the basement. I, I, I've always loved this. He, he just couldn't stand to be not busy, you know. So he set this stump up down in the basement, and he, he'd go out and collect walnuts and bring them in and crack them and shell them and, and uh, put the meats in cans. And I went up there one time, and I said, well, you know, how's this nut business going? He says, oh, it's going real well. He says, you know, people just come to the door just in lines practically to buy these walnut meats. And I said, well, what are you selling them for? And he says, well, I get a dollar for a three-pound can. <laughs> but it was all money to him, you know. Well, this is a picture of my grandfather in 1962 when his wife died. He had given a part of his land along the river to the, to the city for the cemetery. He lived on the bottom down in the floodplain, and then there was a kind of a rolling hill up, and the cemetery was on top of that. And you could see the cemetery and the headstones from his window. And when grandmother died, uh, when they were digging the grave, he sat in the dining room window and watched them up there on the hill digging the grave. In January 1962, with his hat on the table before him, my grandfather waited until it was time to go to my grandmother's funeral. Beyond the window, his 88th winter lay white in its furrows. The little creek which cut through his cornfield was frozen. Past the creek and the broken brown stubble on a hill which 30 years before he'd given the town, a green tent flapped under the cedars. Throughout the day before, he'd stayed there by the window watching the blue wood smoke from the thawing barrels catch in the bitter wind and vanish, and had seen so small in the distance a man breaking the earth with a pick. I suppose he could feel that faraway work in his hands, the steel smooth cold oak handle, the thick dull shock at the wrists. For the following morning as we waited there, it was as if it hurt him to move them, 
those hard old hands which lay curled and still near the soft gray felt hat on the table. Tillage marks, uh, for those of you who don't know, tillage marks, if you, if you find a field in the, uh, a stone in the field and it's crisscrossed with these little scratches, um, those are called tillage marks. This is just a short poem about that. On this flat stone, too heavy for one man alone to pick up and carry to the edge of his field, are the faint white marks of a plow, one plow or many, the sharp blade crisscrossing its face like a lesson scratched there in chalk, the same lesson taught over and over to one man alone in his field for 50 or 60 years or to 50 such men, each alone, each plow striking this stone in this field which he thought to be his. Also in that cemetery in, at Guttenberg, um, there, are, there are many, not many, but a, a number of uh, handmade tombstones. People have, there, there are some up there that are made out of an old school blackboard that the names have been painted on in white enamel and chunks of this blackboard are stuck in the ground. And this particular poem is about one that's, that's been there, was there long before I was born, but, but I've always been fascinated by it. My grandmother had a lamb cake mold, and when we were little, on our birthday, she would make these cakes. It's a cast iron lamb that came together and clamped, and you'd fill it with dough, and then it baked this little lamb, and then she'd put coconut on it, and um, those were our birthday cakes when we were little. And these people that made this gravestone, whoever they were, used a lamb cake mold to make a plaster lamb for the top of the stone. The stone is a piece of concrete, just a chunk of concrete, and then there's this plaster of Paris, or plaster lamb on top. And of course, over the years, the plaster is soft, it's gradually decayed, it's very, it's almost hard to recognize now. A child's grave marker. A small block of granite engraved with her name and the dates just wasn't quite pretty enough for this lost little girl or her parents, who added a lamb cast in plaster of Paris, using the same kind of cake mold my grandmother had. Iron, heavy and black as a skillet. The lamb came out coconut white, and 70 years have proven it soft in the rain. On this hill overlooking a river in Iowa, it melts in its own sweet time. When uh, Kathy and I lived on Washington Street, we had a woman who delivered our paper. It uh, wasn't a paper girl. This was a mature woman who with some little children of her own named Myrtle. Wearing her yellow rubber slicker, Myrtle, our journal carrier, has come early through rain and darkness to bring us the news. A woman of 30 or so with three small children at home She's told me she likes a long walk by herself in the morning. And with pride in her work, she's wrapped the news neatly in plastic, a bread bag beaded with rain that reads wonder. From my doorway, I watch her flicker from porch to porch as she goes, a yellow candle flame no wind or weather dare extinguish. This is a little poem about Nebraska. I, I write a lot of poems that are landscapes, and I, I w I've been real interested in the sort of things that are just sort of left by the road. And, you know, we have these, remember these giant slides that you paid a nickel or a quarter and you went up and they gave you a piece of carpet and you slid down? That was entertainment there for a while in the 50s and early 60s. And this is a picture of one of these abandoned giant slides. Beside the highway, the giant slide with its rusty undulations lifts out of the weeds. It hasn't been used for a generation. The ticket booth tilts to that side where the nickel shifted over the years. A chain link fence keeps out the children and drunks. Blue morning glories climb halfway up the stairs, bright clusters of laughter. Call it a passing fancy, this slide that nobody slides down now. Those screams have all gone east 
on a wind that will never stop blowing down from the Rockies and over the plains, where things catch on for a little while, bright leaves in a fence, and then are gone. Just a couple more and then I'll close here. I, I think every, every poet, or well everyone, not just poets, but everyone would like to do something about their feelings and their anxiety about the possibility of nuclear war. And I, I have from time to time set about to write a piece in which I address this. And I've discovered, and I should have known this long ago because I've been writing and publishing poems for 25 years, but it's very difficult to write a poem about an idea. You can't say, this is my idea and I'm going to flesh this out into a poem. It just doesn't work that way, at least for me. What happens is you find some little thing in nature that fascinates you or some little scrap of language and then the, you let the poem sort of move forward from there. Um, some of these lines sort of stick in my head and so on. The other day I talked to the uh, Nebraska Writers Guild. They had a meeting and I, went, I was their luncheon speaker and, and I was talking about my father to this very pleasant um, woman and, and she was, uh, I was saying how much my father loved to visit with people and she gave me, she came up with this one beautiful line that someday I'll use someplace. It's almost a poem in itself. And she was talking about her father. And she said, my father was always the last one out of the churchyard. Which I think is a beautiful line. Anyway, in this poem, what I've done here is I had learned or read somewhere that there was a type of swallow that has learned to put a little tiny white feather in the front of its nest so that at dusk when it's dark and it comes flying home it can spot its nest in the, at the edge of the barn and, and uh, follow that white spot into its nest. And I was thinking how wonderful that is that an animal like that has developed that sort of skill. And, and at the time I had been reading other things about how after a nuclear blast the insects are blinded by the flesh so that the, so that the bees cannot pollinate the flowers. You know, these little, these little odd things. And, it, and it, you know, it's as far as I'm concerned, I think one of the real horrors of this possibility is man mankind, to be completely cynical, if mankind is burnt from the face of the earth, it's our own fault. But the fact that we're going to take all these other species with us is, is, is very sad, I think. These, these, rather, these innocent creatures who have been riding along with us all these years. So at any rate, this poem tries to come to terms with that. It's called At Nightfall. In feathers the color of dusk, a swallow up under the shadowy eaves of the barn, weaves now with skillful beak and chitter, one bright white feather into her nest to guide her flight home in the darkness. It has taken a hundred thousand years for a bird to learn this one trick with a feather, a simple thing. And the world is alive with such innocent progress. But to what safe place shall any of us return in the last smoky nightfall when we in our madness have put the torch to the hope in every nest and feather. I'm going to close with an elegy that I wrote for my father um, who spent all of his life working in retail stores. Died on New Year's Eve 1979. Father, you spent 55 years walking the hard floors of the retail business, first as a boy playing store in your grandmother's barn, sewing feathers on hats that the neighbors threw out, then stepping out onto the smooth pine planks of your uncle's grocery, salada tea in gold leaf over the door, your uncle and father still young then in handlebar mustaches, white aprons with dusters tucked into the sashes. Then to the varnished oak of a dry goods store, music to your ears, that bumpity bump of bolts of bright cloth on the countertops, the small rattle of buttons, the bell in the register. Then on to the cold tile of a bigger store, and then one still bigger, gray carpet, wide aisles, a new town to get used to. Then into retirement, a few sails in your own garage, the concrete under your feet. You had good legs, Dad, and a good storekeeper's eye. 
Asked once if you remembered a teacher of mine, you said, I certainly do, size 10, a little something in blue. How you loved what you'd done with your life. Now you're gone and the clerks are lazy, the glass cases smudged, the sail sweaters pulled off on the floor. But what good times we had before it was over. After those stores had closed, you, posing as customers, strutting in big flowered hats, those aisles like a stage, the pale mannequins watching, we laughed till we cried. Thank you.